Welcome to Folds and Curves. I'm your host, Mo Cash Koosh. Today's guest is Dr. Aaron McCreary. Aaron is a board certified infectious disease pharmacist and pharmacotherapy specialist at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where she leads the COVID-19 Therapeutics Committee and is a clinical assistant professor at the School of Medicine. She's also treasurer of the Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists and hosts the SIDP podcast, which is called Breakpoints. Erin has emerged as a critical leader throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. I still remember in March when everyone in the healthcare community wanted to know what drugs could be used to treat COVID and nobody really had any answers. But Erin co-authored one of the first and most important therapeutic review papers at that time. It really laid out in a clear way for everyone Here's what we know about the few drugs out there. So now you can make the best treatment decisions based on that available information. Since then, she's continued to be an important source of information and clarity. So I hope everyone can learn something from Aaron's insights. I hope you all enjoy this episode. So let's get started. Um, hi, Dr. McCreary. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, you know, you're one of those people who has just been so instrumental, uh, not just as a clinician treating patients with COVID-19 over the last um, year or so, but also in one of those people who's been so uh, involved in synthesizing all of this clinical trial information and figuring out um, what drugs work and what don't, and, and really just what we know about them and what we don't know about them. So I'm sure as this pandemic's progressed, you've just had a swarm of work and I'm sure your life has completely changed. So could you kind of just describe to us how the last year has evolved for you? Yeah, we're gonna hit the ground running. Um, well, first, thank you for having me. And I, I'm laughing because right before we sat down to start recording a physician uh, across the country in mountain time texted me about, um, there was a new emergency use authorization issued last night for a new monoclonal antibody. And um, we both have built relatively robust monoclonal antibody infusion systems across our health system. And just when you think you have that down pat, you know, we get another drug, which new drugs are great, but a lot goes into it. We were just having a, a text exchange about evaluating whether or not to get combo versus monotherapy and how that would logistically look for patients, which essentially undoes everything we've worked on for the past two months. It basically changes everything. Uh, and we don't get any notice, right? With these things, we see the data with the rest of the world and, um, you know, up last night till 10 o'clock sending emails about this new new drug that got released. So yeah, I mean, this year has been unlike any other for everyone um, and everyone has faced different challenges. Everyone has gone through different things, but I, this has definitely been the most challenging year of my career. And like I said, I think that's true for almost everyone in healthcare. Um, not only just the sheer overwhelming amount of data that comes out and how quickly we had to learn, but these COVID-19 patients are incredibly sick. And early on, especially, they all, like the mortality rates were so high. And they're still very high in patients that end up mechanically ventilated. Overall, for the whole population, they're not as high, but they're pretty darn high in patients that get admitted. And that's largely what we see on the inpatient sector. So, you know, this really dynamic disease, it is, COVID presents with such a variety of phenotypes. So you have outpatients who are asymptomatic and totally fine. And then you have people that end up on ECMO and die. And it's just crazy. And there's really significant immune heterogeneity. So patients have all different kinds of presentations and, and respond differently to different therapies. And I think that science this year has moved at an incredible incredible pace. Um, and you know, we have found some effective therapies. And most importantly, we have vaccines, which is amazing. Uh, we're amazingly lucky that we have two, soon to be four, um, effective vaccines and even more in the pipeline. So that is, mm -hmm. that's really incredible. But, but at the end of the day, like it's a virus and there's no magic bullet for viral illnesses. And those in the infectious diseases space, like especially know that, like this is, while COVID is terrible, this is classic of viral illnesses. There's just not, you have to run it, let it run its course. Um, and some people, that course is nothing. Some people that course is two weeks at home with mild disease, yet you're, you know, have such bad myalgias and fever and pain that you can't even move for 10 days. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that I would call that mild. And I think we've underplayed that, um, how young, healthy people at home are actually quite sick. Uh, and then you have everyone in the hospital. So 
Yeah, and, and just the sheer number of patients, um, like everyone, we all completely shifted our jobs to, to do COVID this year. We haven't made any progress on any other projects, research, patient care things. We don't take care of the general patients that we used to because you know everything's kind of been shifted to COVID. So that's been challenging, but I will say this year has been really rewarding in that I've gotten to work with people all across my hospital, all across the UPMC health system, uh, I've started doing telemedicine. And so I've started working with other community hospitals that are outside of my health system and then also colleagues all across the country and the world. And, you know, we're also connected because we were forced to go virtual, but you know, I, I don't know that I ever would have met like 80% of the people that I talk to every day now, if it hadn't been for this pandemic. And so while absolutely awful, it's also been professionally rewarding in that it's really expanded my, um, the people that I'm learning from every day and, and the different specialties I'm interacting with and, and the different kind of work, like when no one knows anything about something, you know, you all come together a lot and you were all in the same boat of just trying to help. So that's been, um, that's what kind of gets me through the days is, is that professional and, and personal network of friends that are in the field that are just doing the best we can. Yeah, yeah, it definitely feels like a, a very large, uh, immense collective effort across many different, um, you know, specialties and even outside of medicine, uh, even random fields of science that aren't related to, to medicine as well. Um, but I, I, I hope you also appreciate um, how much of an impact you've had. I, I've started following you on, on Twitter and the uh, your like analyses are, are very on point and very widely read and um, just very insightful. So I, I, I did want to kind of um, ask about, you know, a lot of people are keeping an eye on these like case numbers and the, the first wave, the second wave, the third wave. Um, you know, do those, this almost feels like a dumb question, but how much do those waves impact you and your work? Like, do you, f how, how do you feel the presence of those rapidly increasing case numbers, uh, maybe on the way up? And then do you get any rest when these case numbers start to come down? That's a good question. Um, I think it, so, cause in, interesting, so I deal largely in the therapeutic sense, right? And so we're, I lead the UPMC system COVID therapeutics committee. We meet, we were meeting twice a week at the beginning of the pandemic because there was so much data coming out. We were changing our guideline every day. So we were, you know, working with the communications division, updating our intranet system, updating recommendations, working with information technology to put alerts on orders. So when we started hearing, I think the first thing that really concerned me was when I found out people were using incredibly high doses of ribavirin. This was like in February. Um, and, you know, the likelihood that that would impact the virus was very low. The likelihood that that would cause your patient significant harm was very high. And so those are the kinds of things we try to stop people from doing, but understandably people were scared and they were trying to give anything and everything. Mm -hmm. So for about for months in the first wave, that was, that impacted us significantly. No one had any idea what was going on. There was just so much. Uh, we were doing a lot of safety measures and a lot of alerts and restricting use of things and things like that. I will say in June, I think the only two weeks this year where I felt like I went, like I worked a 12 hour day instead of a 16 hour day and where I, you know, felt like I could go sit outside and enjoy the sun um, was in like late June. That was kind of the end of the first wave before the second wave cases had gone down significantly. It was summer, everyone, it was like, you could go outside, uh, people could be communal, but a little safer. And that was like this idyllic kind of two weeks where I think we all were lured into a very false sense of security which we quickly learned because then we had the second wave because everyone started socializing again and then everyone got sick again. Um, and so with the second wave, I think people were like, okay, this isn't going anywhere for quite, for quite some time. And as soon as you loosen up restrictions on lockdown, because in Pennsylvania, we couldn't eat in restaurants for until June, right? And it was like, as soon as things started to open up, even ever so slightly, you know, you start to see case numbers just go insane. And I think people realized like, we this like the bugs always win we say that in infectious diseases with everything but bugs are smarter than humans and they always win and so um that was more like okay we need to be more serious about infection prevention and social distancing and you know not send people outside our families and things like that uh but from a treatment standpoint it stays the same because i can't control when data is going to come out and so whenever data comes out we have to evaluate it immediately right so if a paper is published at 
nine o'clock at night, as soon as I catch wind of it, which is why I am so active on Twitter, you know, that's one of the first ways you see these things. Uh, we have to read it and evaluate and make decisions because people start calling and emailing and asking us what, what to do, you know, almost immediately. Mm. And so, and I can't control when, when data comes out. So we're just trying to always just stay on top of it. So my ebbs and flows are more what we call data dumps. So it seems like there are some weeks of the year where we get five new drugs and huge landmark trials are published and there just seems to be a lot going on in the therapeutic space. And then there have definitely been weeks where I knew of all the trials enrolling and I knew of things that were evaluating. I knew where recruitment numbers were at, but there was no new data to act on. And those weeks are obviously less busy on my end because that's more what we're dealing with. Now that's going to be a different story than someone say who's an ICU intensivist who is working in critical units and intubating patients. Then they're going to feel those waves, you know, much stronger than than we would on the on the kind of consulting therapeutics end. Okay, yeah, that makes complete sense. And so maybe um, that's sort of a, a good segue into something I wanted to ask you about, which is um, when these data dumps happen. Like, what is that process like for you? Because we're all looking kind of from the outside and we see this data and sometimes there's mixed results. Sometimes there's more clear results. Sometimes there's positive results and then other results come out a week or two later, um, you know, muddying the waters. And I, I, I'm, I'd be interested to hear about your process after you start to see for the first time a data dump and then sort of what happens from that point until the point where you... Um, as a clinician and as part of an institution decide whether or not we're gonna wanna use this or not. Yeah, oh, where to begin? So I think <laughs> I'm laughing. I actually recorded a podcast in uh, like May, I think uh, for SIDP and it was called, we titled the episode was happening right now. And <laughs> we said it kind of facetiously, but then we were like, there's no other way to title this. It was, it was literally what is happening right now. And <laughs> myself and two of my colleagues discussed literature evaluation and how to stay kind of calm in a storm. So I think, you know, er, again, early on, early a year ago now, goodness, um, when we started hearing the reports of the behaviors that would cause patients harm, that's the most concerning thing, because first do no harm, right? And so understandably, people are terrified of this terrible new illness that they're seeing, this crazy pneumonia that they don't know how to treat in these very sick patients. Uh, but we first do no harm. And so the only way to use experimental therapies is in the context of a clinical trial. You should never just throw something at a patient because it sounds like a good idea. Uh, never say never, I guess, in medicine or anything, but with few exceptions. The other thing is like, you know, there's what, hundreds of millions of people that have COVID-19, like it's unacceptable to not have data on these things at this point, because there's so many patients, like we could absolutely randomize them into trials. So that's the approach we took at UPMC. Um, and we launched uh, the REMAP trial here, um, we're the flagship United States Center for the REMAP CAP Global Trial Collaborative. And we integrate, we spent about a month integrating that trial into the EHR. And so for a month, we didn't have a trial to enroll patients into, but we told people not to do anything. Uh, we said, give supportive care, no hydroxychloroquine, no azithromycin, no ribavirin, no interferons, nothing. And that was really hard. And we got a lot of angry, you know, emails, calls, prescribers wanted to do something and it was all restricted. We wouldn't allow any of it. And, you know, that turned out to be the right answer because all of those drugs were found to be ineffective and or harmful. Now, what if those drugs were found out to be life-saving and we had spent a month saying you couldn't use them? So that, you know, then we would have gotten a lot of pushback. So we get a lot of praise now for the system we built because it turns out that all of the things we restricted, you know, turned out to be either ineffective or harmful. But I'm very aware that that could have gone the other way and that we would have said, don't give this, but it would have found to be beneficial. But even knowing that, you know, the right answer is still to enroll patients in trials and not to just throw things at a wall and hope that they stick. Um, and so, and a good example of that is corticosteroids. So when COVID first came out, a lot of people said you should not give steroids whatsoever because giving steroids would cause the virus to replicate more, it would dampen the immune system, it would increase infectiousness, increase spreading, increase like have the virus rage out of control and steroids would be harmful. Well, steroids were the first thing that was found to actually help. And so on June mm -hmm. 15th, we found out that steroids were in fact life-saving. Um, but that's why you randomize the trials and you don't just go on like what your gut instinct would be, right? And so 
we, you know, discouraged steroid use, but we did enroll to a trial. So almost all of our patients had access to corticosteroids in the context of rebound cap. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a mess, quite honestly. I mean, what's it like? I mean, you just get the like, same thing you guys feel. It's like when you start a new module in school and the teacher's like, okay, here's this whole chapter and you're going to learn it, take a test on it. And you're like, ah, you have to read something you've never read before about a disease you have no context for and no background for, and you have to make sense of it. And it's hard. Um, so you just rely a lot on your team. So I never made a decision on my own. I have a team of about 40 people. And you know everyone on that team gets the trial. We all read it. We all discuss it. We journal club every single one. You know, someone makes slides, someone talks through the data. We consider everything we hadn't thought of. We discuss not only the data, but then practicality, right? So like, how are we gonna implement this? How are we gonna enforce this? What's the dose? Like, are pharmacies even open at night? What's the timing of administration? You know, all those things have to come into play too in the, in the real world. Clinical trials are one thing, but then implementing therapies are, are quite another. So that's what our team does. And I'm really fortunate to have a big team and that's, you just kinda, you just kind of do it. I will, it's exhausting though. We're tired. Um, if you talk to anyone in healthcare, we're tired. Um, and, but these are our patients right now. So, so we just do it because that's, that's the job. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's great to hear. Um, it's not great to hear how, how hard it's been on everyone, um, including the patients and obviously the healthcare workers as well. Um, but it's great to hear that you do have a team approach. It's also great to hear that journal clubs um, serve a purpose in the real world. It's hard to, to know in school. <laughs> uh, sometimes it seems like yeah. just an exercise. I, mean, I say journal, I mean, you don't have to fill out that sheet exactly, but all the things on that sheet in whatever template you're looking at are in theory beneficial, right? So, um, and, and like, it's things that, you know, it's just how we evaluate data. And I'll go back to that episode we recorded in May of like, what's going on right now? I mean, one of my friends and colleagues on that episode, was just, he was just like, this is like what we do. This is our job. Like you read data and you have to understand, okay, what patients were enrolled in this trial? Like what is the population that this therapy pertains to? Because you can't just read a COVID press release that says, you know, this is beneficial for COVID-19 and then give it to everyone. Because patients, a patient with COVID-19 can mean like 55 different things. Like they're mm -hmm. very different at different stages of severity, um, different comorbidities, different ages, different treatment sectors, et cetera. Um, and so, so understanding the patient population first and foremost is a really important thing. And that the, I mean, one of the Twitter threads I'm sure you're referencing is about a drug called tocilizumab. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of randomized controlled trials with that drug, but they enrolled a whole very heterogeneous spectrum of patients. And so you can't look at like one TOSI trial and say it was negative or it was positive and then just give everyone with COVID-19 in the hospital tocilizumab because that's not appropriate at all. Um, mm -hmm. So the devil really is in the details with a lot of these studies. You cannot just read the abstract and you cannot just read the press release. Um, you have to dig into the data, the supplements, like <laughs> one of my mentors taught me this, but it's so important. The supplemental tables are the best part of the trial. Uh, that's where all the important details are actually hidden in, you know, who may actually benefit or who may be harmed by certain therapies. So about the um, different settings of care you, you mentioned, um, and I, I think that's really important um, that you mentioned that sort of there's not just a drug to treat COVID-19, um, but there's different drugs for different settings um, that can have a positive impact. Um, so what are those different settings? I think everyone kind of knows about that very critically ill patient in the ICU who is ventilated and needs a lot of oxygen. Um, are there other areas on that spectrum that uh, pharmacotherapy is being used for? Um, you know, on the other end, obviously, is the person resting at home, um, basically drinking water and, and sleeping. Um, is there, can you sort of describe what's going on in between those two extremes? Yeah, of course. I mean, we'd probably all be better if we drank water and slept, right? <laughs> there are probably two things that none of us do enough. Um, but so yeah, let's walk through it. I'm probably going to miss something, but let's see if I can walk through it. So mild outpatient COVID. Uh, so mild symptoms, which would be something like nausea, vomiting. Oh, that's what we learn too as we go, right? We learn GI symptoms are actually COVID. Uh, we learned yeah. that in a couple months. In. So these are things we continue to evolve, but uh, mild. So fever, you know, maybe some dyspnea on exertion, 
maybe some mild muscle pain, nausea, vomiting, these kinds of things. Mild symptoms early. So within, you know, nine to 10 days of symptom onset, those patients in theory are eligible for monoclonal antibody infusions. Now that's easier said than done because logistically getting to an infusion center and getting the monoclonal antibody infusion may be difficult because you'd have to see a provider to get diagnosed with COVID and get the referral for the infusion therapy. And then you actually have to go get the infusion therapy. I'm really proud of the system we have at UPMC. We also take patients from all over. You don't have to be from UPMC or have a UPMC PCP to get monoclonals at our health system. And we have established 16 infusion sites across Western Pennsylvania at, as of this moment. Um, wow. so, so monoclonal antibodies are one outpatient therapy. Otherwise, nothing. So otherwise, you shouldn't give steroids if they're not requiring oxygen. Um, again, maybe, but that needs to be a trial. Like you need to study steroids in outpatients before we start giving it. We see a lot of PCPs that are giving like medial dose packs and prednisone bursts and things like this, like it's COPD. And like, we don't know, like maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not, but there's no data. There's no randomized trial in outpatients that say whether or not we should give them steroids. Okay. Um, it's, and the only data that exists are for inpatients and the inpatients that were not on oxygen actually had a signal of harm when they got steroids. The benefit was only found in patients requiring oxygen as they progressed in disease. So that's the two cents on steroids. There was a large trial done in Canada on colchicine for outpatient therapy, the cold corona trial that came out about a week ago. It's available in preprint. Um, it roughly breaks down to like four point not going to remember the exact number, 4.6, 4.8% of colchicine treated patients progress to hospitalization or death versus 6% in the placebo treated patients in those with PCR proven disease. That was actually a significant finding. It's about a 25% risk reduction. And so some have suggested using colchicine in outpatients. UPMC stance is neither for nor against. So if someone wanted to prescribe colchicine, we wouldn't tell them no. Uh, but we don't recommend it either. Uh, I think you have to have that discussion in way. It was a 30 day treatment course. So I think you have to weigh someone having to take colchicine for 30 days for a basically five or 6% chance of being hospitalized uh, versus the risk of diarrhea. And then actually in that trial, patients treated with colchicine had more pulmonary embolisms. But they think it was a chance finding, but it was statistically significant. So, you know, it's any drug you give a patient is not without risk of harm. Yeah. So we, we, are, we have an ambivalent stance towards colchicine right now. Um, I wouldn't take it, nor would I recommend that my mom take it. But if someone wanted to take it, I wouldn't fault them for that, which is a lot of COVID actually. You know, you have to appreciate the gray and appreciate that sometimes there's not like a clear cut right or wrong answer. Um, there's also a fluvoxamine trial going on. You can, anyone can enroll. Um, through the University of Washington, I think you can enroll online. There have been a couple pilot studies that show that fluvoxamine therapy may be helpful. So that's intriguing, but again, should only be done in a trial. There are outpatient trials of therapeutic anticoagulation. So basically empirically hmm. giving people DOAX, um, even if they don't have a VTE or a PE, just because patients with COVID can get pulmonary embolisms and, and VVTs. Uh, so they're studying anticoag and then convalescent plasma, so high titer convalescent plasma in patients with very early in disease at high risk of progression. There's some mm -hmm. studies looking at that as well. There's some early data that it might be beneficial. And then there's studies ongoing evaluating that in outpatients. All of the inpatient data with convalescent plasma shows no benefit. And we actually just switched to not recommend plasma in inpatients at all. Okay. So, so, it's just, um... out, so outpatient, yeah, to recap. So outpatients are like, you can water and uh, Tylenol and ibuprofen and maybe monoclonal antibodies. It's kind of where we're at with outpatients. And then as you progress to getting admitted and requiring oxygen and more severe disease, that's when we get into remdesivir, steroids, maybe therapeutic anticoagulation, maybe tocilizumab, and that's about it. Okay. Um, so a question about the sort of high risk of progression. Um, is this patient, um, does this patient look like someone who has COVID? Um, they were meaning they tested positive for the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, but hasn't necessarily gotten extremely sick yet, but maybe has uh, diabetes or a heart condition or something like that, or, or is that not the right setting? Yeah. Am I understanding that correct? You're on the right track. So I think 
The monoclonal antibody emergency use authorization is specifically approved for patients who are age 65 and older because age is absolutely a risk factor for poor outcomes and severe disease. Um, this disease impacts elderly patients just quite terribly. Their outcomes are quite poor. Um, thankfully, this disease seems to spare children for the most part. Um, kids can get critically ill, absolutely. Like that's not appropriate to say kids are like completely unscathed, um, but overall they seem to fare better than elderly patients do. Um, but the EUAs for age greater than 65, BMI greater than 35, so obesity is a huge risk factor. If you're 55 and older, but you have COPD or hypertension, that would make you high risk. Having diabetes or CKD on its own is high risk. Um, and then in the pediatric age group of those aged 12 to 17, um, obese kids, kids with sickle cell anemia, and then kids that are like medically dependent. So with gastrocnemies or trachs, they would be also considered high risk. So, oh, and immunocompromised patients, of course. So okay. any transplant patient, stem cell transplant patient, solid organ transplant patient, um, active chemotherapy, these kinds of things, all of these patients are, are high risk. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like age and comorbidities are some of the things that are definitely front and center. Um, um, so you, several times you've sort of mentioned um, UPMC's guidelines um, and the, what you're doing in the institution. Uh, how does that, it, well, not necessarily what are the, the nuanced differences between things like the NIH and the IDSA guidelines, but um, are the, does the institutional guidelines, are those like based off of those larger federal ones or are you coming to sort of your own conclusions based on, you know, absolute first principles, what you see in the data, not necessarily considering um, some of these government or society um, guidelines? That's a good question. So we often evaluate and have to make it, we often reevaluate the data and make a decision prior to those guidelines being updated. And that's just because we can be more nimble like that because we're making a decision for, you know, 40 hospitals and, and we have a team of experts that we feel is qualified to make that decision and evaluate that data, but we're not making, you know, like the, the NIH, like they have an unbelievable, amazing section panel, as does the IDSA. I have good friends that serve on both of those guideline panels. They work their butts off, like they, you know, they work really, really hard and they evaluate the data as fast as they can, but they're less likely to make a decision based on a preprint. They're probably more likely to wait for the whole trial set unless it's an absolute game changer like steroids was. Um, and then they, you know, their whole panel has to meet, they have to do a more robust methodology. So those recommendations are usually delayed. We are usually changing our IT support and providing our clinicians guidance in real time because people, our clinicians see the internet just like we do and we have to provide them with guidance much faster. So our recs come out, and then of course, when the NIH and the IDSA and critical care societies and, uh, and what else, when those are updated, we read them and we make sure that you know, we're in tandem. I will say our guidelines do not exactly align with, with either set of guidelines, nor do the IDSA and the NIH guidelines align with each other. And then those guideline sets don't align with the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. So it's a humble reminder that you know, we can agree to disagree on some of these things. Um, people are going to interpret these data differently. And guidelines are, are guidelines. They're not meant to be, you know, exact how we must practice, but we do our very best to provide evidence-based care. A good example though is, so UPMC stopped allowing the use of remdesivir in mechanically ventilated patients, you know, pretty much immediately after all the remdesivir data was finally came out and definitely after the WHO data came out. And the NIH, you know, didn't update their guidelines to make that recommendation as well for like six weeks later. Um, and we got quite a bit of pushback when we, when we first restricted remdesivir for mechanically ventilated patients. And, you know, we said, these are the data and it doesn't seem to benefit that patient population with exceptions, of course. Like if we have a patient that just got transplanted yesterday and they're intubated and they're found to have COVID and they have brand new lungs, like, yeah, we're gonna give that patient an antiviral. We're gonna give that patient anything to try it because that patient is not a patient that fits a clinical trial model, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's always exceptions. If anyone wants to prescribe outside of our guidelines, they just email our therapeutics committee, the case gets reviewed and then we approve exceptions. So there's always exceptions in medicine. Um, but yeah, we made that rec, we got a ton of pushback and then the NIH updated their guidelines later. And then it was like, we told you so, <laughs> like hate to say it. <laughs> 
but I've also we've also been wrong, right? We've also made recommendations that we later had to change because we we learn we learn as we go. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I think uh, there's probably been nobody who's been right about everything throughout this whole. Um, there's no one who's right about everything and anything in life, and definitely not COVID nineteen. Yeah. Um, so I, I like how you mentioned the uh, sort of like clinical trial model. Um, I guess I'm curious, one, what is the clinical trial model? And, and then sort of, uh, you mentioned remap cap earlier. Um, I, I know very little about this, but I, I know it's sort of different from a normal clinical trial. And I was um, curious if you could sort of tell me why it's different and, and what's so innovative and different about it. Yeah, so the remap cap platform is an adaptive Bayesian modeled software trial where when patients enroll in the trial and they're randomized, they're like the platform adapts in the randomization so that you're more likely to be randomized to the more effective therapy. So as data inputs come in, it, it adapts in real time so that patients are kind of adjusted in that regard. So everyone kind of starts 50-50 and then, you know, it might go 60-40 or something like that. Um, but the nice thing is you can just build treatments into the model and we call them domains. And so as all of these new therapies are proposed, we can just add on a treatment arm to the, to the trial rather than having to launch a whole new trial. And that's the same model as Solidarity and Recovery, the other large global trials in that they built one platform and they're putting new drugs in the platform rather than having like trial A for drug A, trial B for drug B. Clinical trials are hard. You need, you know, you need research coordinators to consent patients. You need physicians, attending physicians to consent patients and enroll patients. You need pharmacists everywhere to make sure the drugs get to the patient and the patients are monitored. Um, logistically, just having consent conversations with COVID patients is tough. So we built a, it all electronically. And so we do consenting through FaceTime or through video or through, a, like we do remote consent through video technology, which has never been done before. Uh, and that allows us to break out of traditional academic models where only academic centers could enroll patients in clinical trials. We're enrolling patients at 20 hospitals all across Western Pennsylvania. And our community sites are our top enrollers because that's where a lot of our sickest patients are. Um, and so that's been, that's been such a game changer for how we provide care because you, know, you used to have to be at Cleveland Clinic or UPMC Presbyterian in order to get enrolled in a clinical trial, and now you can be at UPMC Hammett, which is in Erie, or UPMC Altoona, um, and you can be, you know, out in the community and, and still have access to, to these kinds of things and these kinds of therapies, which is really cool. So it's all integrated in the EHR, so all consent is remote, and then all the orders, so once a patient's randomized, the prescriber, when they open the chart, they get an alert in Cerner or Epic, we built it in both platforms, uh, and then that, they just, like, click, and they, like, order the therapy the patient got randomized to, and it's all through this alerting process and all EHR integrated. So it's, um, it's really cool. I'm mostly just really proud of how we're treating, you know, so many patients. Um, and everyone in the system has access to the same level of care and the same opportunities. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It sounds like a major advantage over, you know, having to run like an individual trial for um, each new potential therapy is especially given that there's so many being uh, proposed or, or put forward. Um, thinking about, uh, this is just more of an example than looking hard at the actual trial, but I, I think it was Solidarity was the like global remdesivir trial. Um, and I remember um, people, it, it conflicted with one of the earlier trials and people were very confused and started uh, criticizing the study design um, and saying it's hard to like draw conclusions from this and uh, not necessarily talking about the specific trial but um, you know how does that make your life like a lot harder at, you know looking through this data um, where it's not necessarily clear there may or may not be a benefit um, uh, you know do you just dive deeper and figure out who it has a benefit for or do you just wait for more data? Uh, maybe there's not one answer here, but I'm just curious if you had thoughts on um, these not black and white answers. Um, yeah, uh, we do the best we can, right? So the NIH trials with remdesivir came out first. They were placebo controlled double blinded trials, which are traditionally thought are, are more robust study designs. They introduce less bias. 
And that the ACT-1 trial found that remdesivir, you know, significantly improved your time to recovery by four to five days based on the preliminary and final reports. That's really meaningful when your ICUs are full and your hospital is full. If you can get patients out of the hospital five days faster and they feel better five days faster, that's important. And so people were very encouraged by that data. We wanted to give everyone remdesivir. We did give everyone remdesivir. We still give everyone remdesivir because of those data. Well, the solidarity trial, you know, had that, that and those trials enrolled about a thousand patients, so 500 roughly in each treatment arm. Well, then the solidarity data came out, enrolled, you know, thousands and thousands of patients, a much larger trial, and found absolutely no difference. Found that remdesivir treated patients compared to nothing, compared to standard care, um, it had no benefit. And I mean, quite honestly, no one, that's not what anyone wanted to hear. Um, so, and those results came after the positive findings. And so you try to make sense of this like cognitive dissonance of like, what I know to be true is now false and what is now, now true is not in line with what I want to believe, right? And so you really dig into the trial and try to understand why the results were the way they were. Well, the solidarity trial was, it was a less robust study design. So it was open label, not placebo controlled. And there's a lot of thought that, you know, patients would be kept in the hospital to receive their whole, if you know your patient's getting remdesivir and it's a 10 day treatment course, I'm gonna keep them for 10 days. And then you lose that, like they could discharge early effect because you've now kept them in the hospital. The study authors of Solidarity, I thought did a pretty remarkable job like addressing the open label issue. And they also had one of the best statisticians ever do the statistics on the trial and they found nothing. And so is it unbelievably disappointing? Yes. Does remdesivir do nothing? I don't think so. I think it does benefit certain patients, um, but I do think we probably way over prescribe it. And, but who exactly is that perfect patient that benefits that we're still not sure because all we can do is look at subgroups of subgroups of trials and, and make inferences, but subgroups are hypothesis generating. They're not conclusive. Hmm. And so, um, but we'll never get a large, we'll never get another huge trial of remdesivir again. The largest trial we have says it doesn't do anything. And then some smaller, maybe more robustly designed trials say that it, it helps. And so in the United States, we use remdesivir routinely for almost every admitted patient. In the, in the world though, they don't. So outside of the United States, remdesivir is really not used to treat COVID-19. So I guess we won't really know. <laughs> um, but, you know, some people are very, this is a very like heated topic. Some people are extremely pro remdesivir and some people are very against remdesivir and then some people kind of fall in the middle. Yeah. You mentioned, um, or I guess, how, how do people think about primary and, and secondary endpoints? Like I noticed in a lot of tr uh, studies, um, maybe the primary endpoint wasn't um, super significant, but they found interesting findings in the secondary endpoints. Um, you mentioned that in subgroup analysis, that's hypothesis generating. Is that sort of the same mindset that you have towards secondary endpoints? I, I guess I just never understood why secondary endpoints weren't valuable to some people. <laughs> that's a good question. I, I think secondary endpoints are valuable. Um, I think it just depends on what you prefer, right? So everyone will, you can sit down with 10 people and analyze a trial and discuss it and three people are going to really hone in on one discussion point, three people are going to really be keyed up about another and four are going to all disagree with each other. So that's just life and that's just science. I think COVID and primary endpoints, again, I think we need to, you know, give ourselves, cut ourselves a little bit of slack. We had no idea what was going on. We didn't know what this disease was. So when you're designing a clinical trial for something you've never seen, you know, how do you know what a meaningful endpoint is? We had no idea at the time that some people have such protracted, this long COVID syndrome, right? Like we had no idea patients with an acute viral illness, some of them were gonna be sick for five months. Like who would have thought that, right? And you don't learn that until you're five months into it and you see that patients are still sick. So if you designed a clinical trial in January and you set a primary endpoint of, the most common one we used at the beginning was the WHO made a disease severity scale on either a one to seven or a one to eight of you know anything from discharged home to death. 
And this ordinal clinical scale was the primary endpoint in a lot of studies. So how could you move up or down the scale with a particular therapy? And that, you know, that wasn't a terrible idea, but as we learned more and more about COVID, you know, people became disenchanted with that endpoint because, you know, we're like, at this point, what does this endpoint mean? And, you know, I actually wrote an editorial on, on that and, and the, the use of ordinal scales because, you know, going from mechanical ventilation to death is a lot more meaningful than going from high flow nasal cannula to mechanical ventilation, mm-hmm. you know? Like that, and that's, those are each one point on the scale, but yeah. one has a much greater impact on your patient. And so uh, that's just- that, make, that makes sense. Um, it sounds like, you know, lots and lots of learning has, has gone on over the last year. Uh, you know, lots of hindsight 2020, but um, hopefully um, that translates to being able to put a wrap on things together with a vaccine, um, well, several vaccines. And I also wanted to thank you for your part, not just on the therapeutic side. I know you're very involved uh, in, in volunteering for vaccine clinics. Um, so just wanted to give you a shout out for that. Um, so is there anything you wanted to leave the audience with before we wrap this up? Um, get your vaccine. <laughs> uh, I, sorry, it's not funny. Uh, get your vaccine. I think when your, when your name is called, go get your vaccine. I know a lot of us, especially, you know, healthcare workers or whatnot, who may be working from home right now, you, there's a lot of guilt in getting your vaccine when so many don't have access to it yet. I feel that that's, it's hard, but there's a system and a structure in place and it's not perfect by any means. And we have a long way to go to make vaccine rollout go smoother. Uh, there's a lot of people working really hard to accomplish that goal. Uh, but, you know, if your name's on a list and you get called, you should go get your vaccine because saying no doesn't really fix the overall process that needs fixed. Um, otherwise, encourage all your friends, all your family, all your peers, anyone in the community to get their vaccine as well. So I think we as healthcare professionals and whoever else is listening, you need to address vaccine hesitancy and ensure that as many people as possible get this vaccine so that we can truly end this really, really terrible pandemic. And then I guess last but not least, like just be nice to people. I know that sounds really cheesy, but uh, kindness goes a long way. Everyone is really tired and everyone has worked really hard and there's a lot of things that can easily kind of bring you down and, and then factor in how isolated we've all been. And, you know, no one has anything planned to look forward to uh, because of, of the way of the world right now. So just like, Hope you have a good day. Texts go a really long way. Like you did a great job on that presentation thing. It's go a really long way. Um, and we're all, you know, just kind of take care of each other for looking like at least another year of this. So. Well, on that note, I would like to say you've done a wonderful job on, on this podcast and I hope you have a great day. Uh, it's nice being a, I guess, is it nice? I don't know. I don't know if I like being a panelist or a, a host better. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please check out the show notes so you can learn more about Aaron and where to find her online. All right, take care.